Uh, welcome back to uh, our Greater Bay Area Ship Finance Forum. Uh, this is uh, Marine Money. Uh, our session two is going to discuss uh, the dry bulk market. Now, clearly, the first few months of this year have seen fantastic rates, uh, a huge uh, increase in rates, and uh, this has been reflected in the S&P values as well. Uh, we're going to discuss during this session in a panel later on, uh, and in the presentation first, you know, why this has happened, uh, how long this may last, and the reasons, of course, for the great market we're seeing in dry bulk. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Uh, Louisa Follis, Divisional Director of Dry Cargo at Clarkson's Plateau Asia, uh, and Louisa is going to give us a presentation uh, to introduce the topic about uh, this great dry bulk uh, market. Uh, Louisa, over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kevin, and thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak today. Um, what I'll do now is just share my screen, if you'll just bear with me for a moment to make sure we get the correct screen. And as long as that's looking okay, Andrew, is that that's all okay with you? Yes, that's fine. Uh, Great. Uh, put it on uh, full screen, please. Full screen. Sure. And then we can um, start with the presentation. Okay. okay. Great. Um, so first of all, just sort of looking at at the 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 market at the moment, I think the the sort of key point to to consider here is is the fact that the dry bulk market is actually being supported by a number of factors. So it's actually it's it's a little difficult to to um, put this in a nutshell and and say the sort of one reason why we're we're seeing such um, such uh, rate levels. But overall, certainly um, that the firmer freight rates for 2021. These were actually quite widely anticipated from the second half of, of last year, particularly as the Asian economy started to see the recovery. I mean, we saw that here in Singapore um, and also, you know, we could see signs of it very much so in mainland China and other economies of East and Southeast Asia. And there's real recovery and growth in these economies, um, really starting sort of September, October last year. But what was unexpected was the early start to this rise in, in freight rates and the extent of the rise in which the, the rates rose. And this has really meant that average earnings for, for CAPES are up by more than 300%, even with the recent correction. And for the rest of the dry bulk fleet, we're looking at year-on-year um, -year, uh, growth in, in rates, average earnings of about 200%. So really very strong levels overall for, for the whole um, dry bulk sector. Furthermore, our um, Clark C index, you might have seen um, reported this week in some of the press, saw the strongest quarter Q1 this year in over a decade. And, and for the first five months of this year, so up until last week, the index has averaged its highest level since September 2008, for those who, who um, remember those, those days just before the financial crisis. So extremely firm levels, um, albeit with, with periods of, of um, uh, correcting um, within some of the markets, as we've seen on the Cape size uh, recently. Um, so what's the reason for this? You know, why are we why are we seeing such a, a sort of solid uh, dry bulk market? Well, it's very much in 2021 um, underpinned by by firm economics, um, particularly as the vaccine has rolled out in many uh, economies. There's greater confidence in recovery. Um, the IMF itself, wh whose forecast we, we, we do use, um, initially had a forecast for, for 2021 global GDP of about 5.5%. Now the, the latest forecast is, is looking at about 6%. So we are seeing you know, real growth, real confidence that things are coming back. It's not without hiccups it's not without corrections and certainly you know here in in singapore um we, we have seen a little bit of an uptick in the number of covid cases a bit more stricter controls uh, and certainly in southeast asia the likes of malaysia indonesia have have seen unfortunately some some quite uh large scale outbreaks of covid again so perhaps a little bit of softening in economic activity shops restaurants and even the construction sector 
And I think this is really where the IMF sort of brings in their comments about high uncertainty surrounds the outlook um, because of the path of the pandemic is, is generally just not known. Um, a lot of it depends on, on government policy and also the financial support, the level of financial support that's given to, to the economies. But I think one trend that we're seeing in general is this building our way out of COVID. Um, the construction sector um, here in Southeast Asia really is at, at full, full pelt. Um, the problem is getting enough labor. Um, so that is, is probably slowing things down a little at the moment. But um, even behind me, I can hear the, the, the noise of, of um, the piling going on for a new skyscraper here um, in, in front of the, the container terminal. So, you know, a lot of industrial activity, a lot of um, steel demand, a lot of cement demand, um, aggregate demand. And of course, this is also supporting the iron ore trades. So what does it mean for shipping overall? Well, as countries build their way out of COVID to catch up with lost work from last year, generate jobs, generate economic growth. As I said, this does mean more steel demand, cement demand, aggregate demand, and so on. And it's really helped support the steel um, complex. We can see in the chart I'm showing here on the screen now, the um, Q1, Q2 position for 2021 in the light green color, you can see that uh, we're, we're experiencing real growth in these seaborne trades for construction materials, um, Q1 this year compared to Q1 last year, and for Q2 it's even stronger. And we can compare this with the three-year average and also what, the, what we saw in 2019. And I think we're pretty much on track to see those kind of volumes again, the, the sort of 2019 volumes. Um, as I said, this is largely um, largely relating to um, perhaps uh, Asia Pacific expansion, Asia Pacific growth in in um, the construction sector, but we're also starting to see signs of the U.S. Um, potentially going to spend some of the stimulus money that the Biden administration is is bringing through, and certainly when we look at signals such as the US infrastructure related share prices. We can see, we've just put these on an index here on the right hand side, and you can see some of these companies really lifting in, in their um, uh, earnings uh, at, at the moment. The, 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 the share price um, really has grown quite strongly as the expectation of more construction, more building goes ahead. Now, what does this affect in terms of shipping? Well, certainly the handy market and the supermax market have really benefited from, from these trades. Um, and we would expect um, something like this sort of trend to, to, to continue or to certainly be well supported through the year, unless there's some kind of stoppage or, or a slowdown or lockdown. But it, it, this sort of um, optim conservatively optimistic view would be that the countries, uh, key countries, will continue to build their way um, out of the, the the current situation, out of the current economics. Now, of course, further down the line, this is supporting the the broader um, steel complex, iron ore sector, and as we've seen in prices, you know, the, the prices themselves have been um, at, at uh, extraordinary levels. The shipments of of iron ore coming from Australia and Brazil. Both have shown growth um, for the first five months of this year. These charts show the, the red line is 2021. And we can see that for Australia, we're looking at about 1% growth. But for Brazil, we're looking at 16, 17% growth. So it really is quite remarkable. Um, and at the moment, we're really seeing a supply constraint on, on, um, on the iron ore pricing sorry, on the iron ore supply leading to the, the firmer rates for iron ore prices. So, you know, the, the producers are really pushing out as much as possible at the moment, <clears throat> excuse me, and this in also includes the incremental producers incentivized by the high numbers that they're seeing um, on the buyer side. So firm volumes for the iron ore, firm volumes for the, excuse me, firm volumes for the, um, also for the uh, construction materials, but we're also seeing firm volumes for, for other sectors too. So if we sort of move down the list here, we're also seeing rising volumes 
um, for, for grains and coal, and, and both of which are moving over longer distances. So, of course, this is adding to the, the tonne mile position. If we take coal to begin with at first, um, why are we seeing more coal being traded? Well, essentially, it's economic recovery, more industrial demand, more business demand, and this translates into more energy demand, and therefore a rise in coal shipments versus last year. Um, there has been a bit of a shift in some of the, the trading patterns, as, as those who follow this market will have certainly seen, um, but overall we are seeing volumes come back, um, maybe not back to 2019 levels, you can see on the chart on the right-hand side, um, but certainly bouncing back from, from 2020 numbers and growth of about 5% this year in total. Um, so that's cooking coal and steam coal, total seaborne trade. I think most analysts out there are sort of looking at this sort of 4 to 6% kind of range. Um, of course, a lot depends on, on, on the weather at the back end of the year and also the hydro production mid-year in many economies. But roughly speaking, I think this is this is sort of ballpark figure of, of the expectations for, for growth. Similarly so, we're seeing expansion in the key grain and oilseed exports. Oilseed, of course, dominated by soybean. And why are we seeing this kind of growth? You know, we did see um, about 6% expansion last year, um, which was quite remarkable. And this year we're seeing another 4 or 5% um, expansion in, in grains. Um, well, it's no secret um, to, to say a lot of it is driven by the recovery in, in China's pork industry um, and the need for more animal feed. I mean, that's the primary um, demand side that, that we're seeing. But also we're seeing quite decent um, harvests and quite decent yields from many key producers, um, such as the, the recent soybean export season that we're coming to an end with in um, East Coast South America. Um, so the, the grain season in general, China's demand for corn this year is something unusual. The population growth in many key areas such as Southeast Asia and also the change in diet um, towards um, perhaps a more um, flour-based, a more uh, grain-based uh, feed for, for the animals, so more meat demand. This is also raising grain and oilseed trade. On top of this, we're also seeing many delays and um, a rise in, in port congestion. Um, I mean, this is very, very uh, fragmented and very granular to go through in, in, in such a short space of time. But the bottom, the bottom line is, is that it really adds to inefficiency of the fleet. So a rise in, in quarantine uh, measures, as we've seen reported in many um, newspapers, um, as the difficulties in, in changing crew, um, delays in allowing vessels to call at one port following a, a, another port calling. Um, this really does combine to create a tighter fleet position, um, as well as some um, sort of politically uh, motivated disputes over vessels, uh, vessels discharging, and, and just simply the rise in volumes leading to congestion on loading in some, in, for some commodities. So tightening the fleet growth and this inefficiency effectively is another supportive factor for the current freight rates. Now, on top of this, we're also seeing relatively low fleet growth, especially in the smaller sizes. And we're looking at about 4% overall this year for the dry bulk fleet. Again, I think that's quite widely reported, um, this sort of level. You could take away some of the numbers here, I mean, perhaps um, reduce that number if you really do incorporate some of the congestion levels or you could inflate that level if you start adding um, perhaps that the vessels returning from, from scrubber fitting in, in late 2020, um, coming back into the fleet this year. But I think for 2022, the fleet growth numbers that, that many analysts are sort of pushing around now is, is around this sort of 2 to 3% um, fleet growth, which is certainly a lot less than we've seen in the last few years. A lot of it's dominated, um, or that the tightness is, is really seen in the smaller sizes overall. Um, but next year, I think we'll, we'll see this across the board of sort of tighter fleet growth levels for 2022. So is this, um, is this sustainable or is this just a flash in the pan? You know, is it something that we're, we're going to see corrected um, anytime soon? Well, I think the market the market seems to think 
it is sustainable. I mean, we can see this certainly in vessel value assessments and also time charter rates. So, you know, if we, we look at, this is just an, an indication of, um, of one year TC rates, we can see how these, these numbers have come up very strongly since the start of the year. Um, certainly charterers are concerned that they might get caught out with, with very high spot rates. So taking in tonnage, um, I understand for, for, for many charters has been a prudent move to, to try and avoid um, the, the spikes in the spot market and really gives an indication that the feeling is that the, the support is, is going to last for, for a little while yet. Um, we can see, as I said, that's also the case in um, asset values, so secondhand prices. Um, in the absence of any large scale ordering of new buildings, Certainly the, the second-hand market, I'm here I've just taken five-year-old vessels, but the same can be said for 10 or 15-year-old um, ships as well. We're seeing this increase in demand for second-hand tonnage uh, and prompt, uh, and therefore that, that's what's um, really helping support the asset value. Um, and again, it's an indication, I think, of the confidence in, in the dry bulk market overall. So I think certainly charters will, will need to be wary of these signs of strengths. Um, in in the market, um, and just to to conclude with, um, you know, as I said at the start of of these these slides, it, it's a well supported dry bulk market. In essence, its vessel demand growth is larger than fleet growth this year. That's what we're seeing. Um, we've got sort of the four main points: strong underlying macros or fundamentals, recovery and expansion in seaborne cargoes relatively high levels of congestion. It's not record levels, but fairly high and modest fleet growth this year with um, fewer deliveries. I think before we, we finish um, from, from, from my side, uh, it, it is important to address the risks. Um, you know, this is not a one-way bet. Um, certainly, there is the risk of more COVID lockdowns and, and tighter, uh, tighter controls on, on economies um, and I think if you start seeing that affecting energy and construction, then that, of course, would, would take away some of this support. Um, secondly, any sort of anti-inflation measures, cooling measures to, to sort of reduce the extent of growth, um, this is also a risk to, to the steel complex in particular. Any decarbonisation controls also um, could be a risk for the, the, the steel and aluminium smelters. Um, should the, the efforts be put in to, to reduce output in, in the sort of heavy, uh, heavy polluting, heavy industry sector and any kind of rise or, or, or increase in trade disputes as we've seen in the last couple of years, this also um, can make its mark on the dry bolt sector. Um, the weather is always ahead of us. <laughs> There's plenty to come um, before the harvesting in the, in the Northern Hemisphere in particular. So, you know, we do have to look at the weather in, in, in relating to, to um, crop yields and, and coal demand, for example, and also the pricing of commodities, which is exceptionally high this year. You know, whether that elasticity of, of demand for some of those commodities will start, will start to feel, um, feel the pinch. Um, and then finally, should we get any sudden increase in vessel, vessel efficiency? So, for example, if the congestion disappears, if the quarantine measures are put to one side, if the vessels speed up, there are various factors here that could actually make the fleet much more efficient. And this would um, perhaps uh, put a downside pressure on, on freight rates should that happen very suddenly um, in, in this market. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a flavor of, um, of some of the supporting factors here. Um, and I shall hand back, I think, um, to Kevin, if, if that's okay with you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Louisa, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation and uh, for the very bullish, uh, bullish uh, words on, on the dry bulk market. And uh, we're pretty happy to hear that it is likely to be sustainable for at least a, a year to come or maybe a bit longer than that. So I think uh, our panel to come uh, should be uh, feeling quite good about it. Okay. So Louisa, if uh, I can ask can you I... to... Yeah, go on. Yeah. Go on. Yeah, just just one more comment. I mean, on this, I'm I'm really sort of pointing to to the sort of the market thinking. It's um it's it's a bullish scenario. Um, just to just to emphasize, you know, it's not a a forecast. Um, in sure. in any way. Um, so 
you know, I can't be quoted on 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 this, but yeah, I, I yeah. think the mar the market itself is certainly looking at a well supported market. Thank you. Understand. Understand. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa, very much for that. And if I can ask our panelists to um, put their cameras and their microphones on, please. Okay, perfect. So thanks, Louisa. That was a very kind of um, upbeat uh, presentation, um, something we haven't really heard for a few years in the dry bulk market, I guess. Um, so that was very welcome. Uh, we're now going to um, have a panel discussion um, uh, about the dry bulk market. Uh, let, you, let me just point out to the audience that during this discussion, you are able to um, send in questions. Uh, you can see it on your screen there. You just uh, pull up the menu on the right-hand side and uh, write your question in where it, uh, in, in, in the red in the red box there. I will receive those questions at, at the end of the discussion. I will be able to, um, on your behalf, ask a few of the questions to the uh, to the panelists. Okay, let me introduce uh, the panel. We have Mr. Mats Berglund, Chief Executive Officer, Pacific Basin Shipping. Uh, hi, Mats. Uh, Pacific Basin, I'm taking these figures from uh, Vessels Value, but just to give you an idea, Pacific Basin, uh, they're running about 115 uh, bulkers, um, most of which are handy, handy size, uh, but about uh, 30 or so, 35 or so are Panamax, uh, Supermaxes and Ultra Maxes. Uh, Mark Young, uh, who is Chief Executive Officer of Asia Maritime Pacific. Hi, Mark. Uh, AMP, uh, they're running a fleet of about uh, 30 vessels, uh, all, pretty, all on the small sides, so about half of them are handy bulkers. Um, and the other half are, are, are even smaller than that, they're general cargo vessels um, running around uh, much of uh, Southeast Asia and the like. Uh, we have Mr. Vikrant Bhatia, Executive Officer of KC Maritime. Uh, hi, uh, Vikrant. Uh, KC Maritime running a fleet of about uh, 11 vessels, uh, one, a few Panamaxes, a few Ultramaxes, uh, and uh, a couple of smaller vessels. We have Asaf, Asaf Malamud. Um, Chief Executive Officer of Dragon Port Bulk, part of the Portland uh, Group. Uh, hi, uh, Asaf. Um, the the, port, the Portland uh, Group are running about uh, nine vessels, uh, eight Ultramaxes, one Supermax. Uh, and we have uh, William Fairclough, Managing Director of Wak Wong Maritime Transport Holdings Limited. Uh, hello, uh, William. Um, and uh, Wak Wong have uh, various vessel types, of course, but uh, they have about 10 bulkers. Um, a couple of capes, a couple of post Panamax bulkers, Panamax bulker, Ultramax, and handy bulker. So it's uh, very noticeable that our panel today are sort of pretty pretty much uh, absent from the cape size, apart from uh, one or two with their uh, Wak Wong, um, and mostly focusing on the kind of um, Ultramax uh, and, and and smaller. Uh, and as uh, Luisa just uh, mentioned, basically all all vessel sizes within dry bulk are, are benefiting from the, this current. Uh, uh, very good market. Um, but I'd like us all just first of all to go back uh, 12 months or so, back to June 2020 when things were very different. Um, and perhaps you could just say, tell us, you know, how you were feeling then, um, how, how bad was the market, and um, if you were able to be optimistic at that time about what was going to happen next. I mean, maybe, perhaps Matt's, you with the largest fleet, uh, go back to two, June 2020 and tell us. Uh, what your thinking was at that time? Do we have to? <laughs> I think we pre prefer to be in today's markets, right? So, but yeah. anyway, no, it was obviously an, a very uncertain time, but China came back very quickly, as you recall. And I think June was actually the first month that we had minor bulk cargo volumes back up to prior year uh, levels in, in, in June of 2020. Uh, grain never went down, as Luisa pointed out, right? So grain grew throughout the year. People have to eat animals mm. and people in spite of the pandemic. A coal was down the most, uh, et cetera, but it was obviously, you know, a very uncertain time. We paused our buying of secondhand ships uh, due to the uncertainty. Uh, but, you know, we did do some looking back at that time and v-shaped recoveries are the most common recovery so to speak uh, but you know we we did not dare to to be bullish at that time and i think it's important to remember that uh, the covid uh, is still not over right it's still still uncertain although we're 
in a very strong market now. Mm -hmm. Okay, Vikrant, what about you? A year ago? Uh, I think we, you know, the when, when we did our supply demand analysis, it was quite clear that the supply side was going to support the dry bulk market. Uh, and we also took a view that, you know, once uh, we come out of the pandemic, you can, you know, vaccinations were starting to roll out at that time. Uh, once we come out of the pandemic, uh, economies will be forced to actually spend their way out of, uh, out of the, you know, out of their low GDP numbers or negative in some cases. So I think we were, we, you know, we were actually inspecting tonnage, second-hand tonnage at that time, uh, looking to, to buy ships uh, more in the Supermax side, because that's where we felt uh, you know, the growth would start in Asia. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, unfortunately, we're not able to, to buy tonnage because uh, we always got outbid by some of the public money that was, uh, that was there. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, in, in the dry bulk market, you can always have a, a kind of like a macro view, but it's difficult to actually uh, identify, you know, when the markets are going to turn. So even as late as early December, none of the analysts were giving the strong forecasts that uh, that the forecasting the big numbers that we saw in the first quarter of this year. Okay, thank you, uh, Mark. I mean, you're you're in that category of vessel, but you're also in the smaller kind of general cargo type vessels. Um, was your thinking any different at that time? No, actually, I I have the exactly same feeling. Um, you know, the uh, in the June um, 2020, you know, the market was still pretty low, I would say, uh, both for the handy and for the smaller ship, particularly. Um, we start to see actually a lot of cargo uh, start to coming up in the market. I mean, back to the uh, 2019 time, but the freight rates are still at a very low level. Um, um, you know, we had uh, our internal discussion. You know, I um, my view is the 2021 it can be very good, but of course, you know, nobody can see the 2021 can be today's good, can be that good. Exactly. Okay, Will. Let's let's uh, another question for you. I mean, you're you're the only amongst our panelists, the only one with a couple of cape sizes. Um, and I, I noticed uh, in various reports I received during the week that, you know, the, the kind of spot rate for uh, each of the vessel sizes for Supermaxes, Panamaxes and Capes, they're only a few thousand dollars apart, actually. And where, whereas, you know, mid-twenties is pretty good for your, your um, Panamaxes and especially for your Supermaxes. I mean, Capes at 20 something is good, but, you know, it could be better. I mean, so do you see the, the Cape market sort of um, substantially improving? as the year goes on? Yeah, I, th I hope so. Normally, I think we're used to seeing the handies outperform in a really bad market, and you get that steadiness and capes are close to zero, and that's probably where we were a year ago. Um, we've had everything was close to zero. Um, I think at the time we identified as a tanker market, we ignored the fact that half our nicks come from bulk because it was so depressing. But in terms of, you know, our thinking then was uh, the ships that we had really delivered, we looked to to take them short because we had belief that it was the bottom. I think it was clear to everyone it was the bottom. Um, but then Q3, Q4, as we start to saw the improvement, in our case, we took cover because we felt, okay, let's get us through the, you know, the belt and braces through the Q1, which is normally the tough bit. And of course, that's when the capes suddenly, you know, took off. Um, and I think in terms of relative value uh which that value is always relative on the smaller sizes i think they've had a tremendous help from the container market there's no doubt that there's so much crossover and the smaller the ship the more that you know so for for, for mark and, and matt's they're having all sorts of cargo that would have been in in boxes um you know a year ago and you've got to remember that the, the container market in the first half of last year everyone was you know despite what's happened in terms of Analysts who can get things well, we're not analysts, yeah, that's all of us. It, I remember the headline was COVID here, is this the end for containers? You know, is this is that it? Of course, it's just, you know, held it in the sort of best container market anyone's ever seen. And that's laid the groundwork for so much of what's um, quite, you know, quite encouraging for the next couple of years because everyone's got an order chip. So that's a different discussion. But, you know, the container market has had a tremendous overspill onto smaller ships and grain as well. You know, there's a lot of grain was quietly, no one really has figures for it, no one quite sort of is able to track, was going in boxes. 
and forget about it now. You know, everyone's buying garden yeah. furniture, barbecues in the West, so there's not enough room for the grain. So that's had a huge impact on the smaller ships. And I think it's probably part of the reason we've got this sort of inverse earnings. And, you know, that could go on for ages. I would caution 2023 and 24, we've seen a huge order book placed for container ships. That looks, I mean, you know, worrying, I would say, in the least. Um, and, of course, if suddenly, you know, your average consumer all over the world is no longer just buying stuff and there's, there's a movement back to, you know, kind of uh, travel and uh, services rather than, you know, just pure consumerism, that, that could happen just as container market sees, you know, a, a huge influx of new tonnage. And that, that will inevitably have a spillover. You know, there's multi-purpose ships that sit in the middle and then there's smaller ships. Capes are allowing their own furrow. I mean, we heard about it earlier in the presentation from, you know, all of the um, stimulus that's going into a kind of hard building materials. And, you know, from an iron ore perspective, the numbers are encouraging. Um, I think they could remain disconnected for the time being. There's no inevitability about caves going up because handies are higher. They're actually driven, and Matt has been telling us this for years, that, you know, don't just look at the other things, you know, they have their own world, and now we can see it, for sure. And, you know, there's other things you need to watch necessarily, and, and I think this is the proof. But generally speaking, you know, when, when it goes down, it goes down for all of us. And that, a year ago in June, it was pretty miserable for everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let, let's stay in today's market then, and Asaf, if I can ask you, I mean, Luisa was, uh, you know, she was a, a positive uh, presentation, and she also seems to think that it's likely to go on for quite some time to come. I mean, what's your feeling in terms of inquiries from charters and all this kind of stuff? I mean, do you think uh, we're going to see this good market lasting for a while? Yeah, of course, all, all definition of a while. Um, we like the fundamentals in the next two years uh, going forward. Um, we see, and Louisa talked about it, good demand, um, both uh, coming from general increase in, in economic activity and building, and we see this across, across the board and really helping um, vessels that us on the panel uh, own and operate, which is the supers and ultras, uh, versatile and able to pick up almost any cargo in the dry bulk world. So we see this across, as mentioned, cement, coal, wood products, definitely grains and soya beans and corn. Um, that said, I think, um, at least from our point of view, the confidence in the next two years mainly stems from the supply side, which is essentially fixed. Um, always harder to predict demand, but um, at least from our visi visibility, um, we like the near term, definitely, and uh, perhaps also um, the medium term. Okay, perfect. So we'll, we'll move on to supply in a couple of moments, but let's, let's just, um, bearing in mind, we all seem to be quite optimistic about the next couple of years. What's, what's your company's um, chartering strategy then? Is it, um, is it to sort of fix Fix, fix, you know, fix for a decent period of time for you know, 12 months or 18 months and lock it all in or play this, the spot market? So um, just to correct you on the, on the we're, we're about at 20 ships um, these okay. days as part of our fleet renewal, mainly focus on the Ultramax. Mm -hmm. And when you have a fleet of whether it's 10, 20, 120, um, you have to definitely play the, uh, the entire portfolio. Uh, generally speaking, we like the near term, so we're we're still fixing short, but um, need to be prudent and take um, some duration where we see charters um, more and more open uh, to this kind of um, concept of fixing uh, both forward and longer duration. So that's something where we're very happy also to work together with our close charters and um, find good structures and um, and good ways to go forward together. Mm -hmm. Matt says, is, uh, is Pack Basin sort of tending to sort of lock, lock vessels in for longer periods now, or, or is that not the case? No, not yet. Uh, we think there's more, you know, you can't book cargo long term at uh, spot levels, right? You know, spot mm -hmm. surprise making 25, ultra 27 a day. Mm -hmm. uh, and handy uh, also above 20, right? So you can't book car long-term cargo at that. Uh, so our customers need to get used to that for a little bit longer. Short period is is uh, is very good value out, but uh, 
a uh, long long period not you know physical time shorter out is higher than than cargo and again we we like the spot and this is harvest time and it's been a long wait uh, mm -hmm. and fundamentals look good yeah. as uh, many of the others have have mentioned so uh, yeah. uh gradually uh, becoming more open for for every month that goes by but we were 80% open to start with so okay uh, yeah okay vikrant with you chartering strategy i think uh you know pretty much the same as what matt said we've got a, a lot of vessels uh, that are fortunately open and uh, able to to harvest as we said you know we talk about shipping cycles and you know it's 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 uh it's eight years of famine and two years of feast right so you mm -hmm. better feast while we have it uh yeah. and uh uh, so yeah, but at the same time, you know, uh, the company is very conservative, uh, risk averse. So we'll be, uh, yeah, as, as you know, I'm stepping out of the management team, but yes. uh, the company will uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, look at uh, taking some some cover it, because yeah, you know, the markets are very volatile and uh, uh, things could turn around quite quickly. So we will, I, I'm sure they will take some cover uh, to 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 cover you know, more than uh, the one year. Yeah, absolutely. So I know yeah, it, it does seem to be a very good time to sort of cash, cash cow the current uh, spot market in the, and, and build up some uh, nice uh, cash levels. Let's turn over to supply a little bit. Um, again, as Luisa said, and as, as you said, as, uh, as well as Saf, I mean, supply looks very sort of controlled over the next uh, couple of years. Um, and interestingly, uh, again, uh, some statistics I saw uh, recently, although um, S&P values for second-hand values have increased a lot in the last uh, six months, you know, maybe 50-60% up on some uh, vessel types, actually the number of new buildings contracted has fallen year on year. Um, so there's some degree of uh, uncertainty and I suspect it's all to do with the kind of um, the fuel and the propulsion discussions and all this kind of stuff. But uh, I mean, Mark, on, on the supply side, I mean, you must be feeling uh, you know, quite quite optimistic. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, um, you know, based in Shanghai, you know, I have the chance to talk with various shipyard, um, various um, the, the 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 leasing company, which is very closely involved with the various shipyard activities. Um, I think, at least from the uh, Chinese shipyard side, that the dry bulk uh, new building order is still quite limited. Mm -hmm. um, I I think there's um, various reason for that, but it it looks like uh, compared with the old crazy days, uh, the last boom, or in the so-called new eco ships come to the market. I think this time, I think people are more uh, cautious when they're trying to jump into this uh, short boom, uh, which is still quite a short time yet. Um, I, I'm pretty confident. I think the supply side this time can look pretty different uh, than the uh, 2014 or even before the 2008. And, and will I mean, uh, uh, there's a a lot of publicity around a um, a very recent IPO on the London Stock Exchange from a Hong Kong-based. Uh, company i mean they are clearly buyers of vessels another little drift shipping company however listed on the london stock exchange said recently that dry bulk vessels are too expensive and it's a selling opportunity so you know there are there are two two schools i guess in a market like this i mean uh, is is selling at these high levels uh, the second hand vessels i mean is that uh, an, an attractive option um at least you know i personally i don't think this is necessarily a right time to sell in. Uh, to sell, I mean, um, I, I agree. The uh, the second hand price has been uh, to some of the sectors has doubled, um, but if you look at the historical value and if you try to discount the de depreciation, I, I I'm not necessarily say it's necessarily a, a huge good buying opportunity, but definitely I I will be reluctant to sell in this move. Okay, Will, Will, what do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, I think from the perspective of buying or selling, it very much depends. And, and you talk about the IPO, and now, of course, we're 
original investors who probably invested um, some years ago, five, six years ago in a much lower market who, who are actually selling into that. And so it all depends on your, in, you know, your entry point and your investment horizon on, you know, the, the, in attempting to think about buying or selling in one lot. You know, what, there's no, there's no right or wrong answer. You know, there's no, there's no black or white. Should you buy or sell? You know, it, it, it certainly may make a lot more sense for a, a fund-driven investment to, you know, to, to exit now. And I think the um, advantage of this market is it provides opportunity for buying and selling. You get a lot more liquidity, and that I think makes all of our jobs in a way more interesting. Um, because from a portfolio approach, as as I've said earlier, you know. You need to consider: Are you going to still be in this industry? Do you intend to still be in this industry in, in you know, five, ten, you know, years going forward? And, and from our perspective, yes, of course, you know, it's about allocating capital to different sectors, ensuring we keep, um, you know, a, a relatively um, relevant age profile on the fleet. So there'll always be ships that are natural sales candidates, and you need to have a replacement. And of course, you know, you have to navigate that. So would you just put the whole lot on the on the market? And, and um, you know, just sort of sell a lot, uh, really good to. But I think if you're a fund and you're going to go invest in something else, that's fine. But I, obviously, as a shipping company, as Mark said, you want to harvest now. You know, and everyone said it now. You know, now is the time. It's very difficult to sell a ship when you look at the potential earnings that we are likely to make in the next, say, you know, 12 months, which is fairly, you know, predictable in terms of, you know, you can you can commit that that sort of uh, earnings. So I think it, 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 there are a lot of investors who came in um, and were sort of fun backed. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the kind of talked about it earlier, you know, the, the the big boom in 2015, 14, 15, 16, a lot of it was private equity backed. They'll be looking at this at a very good opportunity to sell. And, you know, I think that may provide an opportunity for existing, you know, incumbent players to, to pick up some more tonnage, you know, depends on the age, age profile and everything else. So I, I think it's very difficult to generalize. There are more buyers and there are more sellers. There's more activity, and that's, I think, what makes it quite interesting. Okay, uh, uh, let's switch a little bit on to sort of finance, if I may. I mean, your fleets are making a lot of money these days. You're probably sort of, um, you know, putting a lot of money into the bank. What, what's the usage? What's the optimum usage of that money? Is it sort of down payment of uh, debt? Is it, uh, you know, wait, sort of sitting and waiting for the right opportunity to uh, reinvest? Give it back to your um, shareholders, perhaps. I mean, Matt. I think it's certainly time to uh, pay dividends to patient shareholders. It's been uh, a tough market, right? So mm -hmm. we have a 50% of bottom line uh, uh, dividend policy, and don't see any reason to to change that. But you know, cash flow is extremely good uh, at this time, and you know, we would also be more on the buying side than selling side you know secondhand prices uh, you mentioned prices are high we don't think they are that high mm -hmm. yet right Com last time we had rates similar to this was 2010 mm -hmm. and you know 2010 uh, a five to you know five to ten year old supras was 25 30 million you know we bought six ultras in the last uh, you know we bought four from Scorpio and two more early this year for 13 to 17 million and they're now above 20 but you know they're nowhere mm -hmm. close to where they were 2010 mm -hmm. uh, and you know a ship like that is making $27,000 per day today yeah. and has a cash cost of six so that's seven eight million to the capital mm -hmm. per year mm -hmm. scrap value is five Right, so it, it's th those are fantastic investments. Still, a a uh, f let's say a fifteen-year-old handy was down to four. Now it's up to seven or eight. But in 2010, that ship was valued at 15 million. So we think uh, you know it's still opportunities to buy if you find the right ship, uh, the right design, Japanese, etc. Uh, but, you know, definitely uh, not selling yet. We think, uh, you know, returns are fantastic and there's got to mm -hmm. be more upside on on asset values. And if not, that's fine. Then we're just going to sail in the money. So okay. uh, that makes it very different from the container market as well, right? Because you don't have the alternative to, there's no liquidity to buy secondhand ships like we have in, yeah. in dry bulk. Yeah, yeah. 
Vikrant, what about you? I mean, use of use of use of cash flow. Yeah, I, I think uh, you know, ship owners, uh, uh, private ship owners like ourselves, are faced with a with a big dilemma at the moment. Is you know, how long do you estimate this harvesting of cash will last, and when do you take advantage of asset values? Mm -hmm. uh, particularly, you know, as you have uh, you know strong regulation coming in in uh, in you know by 2023, 2025, and which may actually impact asset values. So there's that there's that dilemma is you know okay you know how long do I trade the vessels and when do I sell out and get into more uh, let's say you know better higher higher EXI or CII friendly vessels. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I think uh, you know you, there, there there are markets when you can be both buyers and sellers. So perhaps there's advantage in 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 you know taking advantage of some of these high values today and trading then into you know vessels that that may have a longer economic life uh, than than something that exists in your fleet and could that be a new building uh, i think there's there is a general reluctance from private owners to order new buildings solely driven by the regulatory side especially you know with with the uncertainty on fuel now you know the the technical barrier i think with fuel is not the impediment. The impediment is the economic uh, uh, sort of rationale for those much more expensive ships, and can that where is that cost going to be passed on? So, uh, so you know, so so we I think you know we will see uh, these changes coming sooner rather than than later, uh, and even probably exceeding the defined timelines that we have today. Okay. But there must come a time, I suppose, when you know, as, as second-hand values continue to go up and new building prices continue to be flat. Asaf, maybe you could sort of comment on this. Yeah. You know, in, investing in new building dry at some point. Okay, we keep the regulation side apart, but at some point it must become interesting. Uh, I think it does. Um, we see the same trend happening in the container segment um, with, with, as mentioned, lack of liquidity on the second-hand tonnage and people going to the yards um i hope it doesn't happen on a large scale in in our space and and it's important that we don't see the same mass ordering um, from various players like we did in in 2013-14 and, and and even longer in the past um that said uh, we we at portline have, have ordered ships in the past we've gone to japan uh, primarily um it could be something that we'll look at. Um, we are going through a fleet renewal, so we don't necessarily look to speculate on, on new buildings or, or any tonnage. We'll be getting our five-year-old Japanese Ultramax in about a month, so we will be joining our fleet. So we look at secondhand definitely, and I agree with a few of the comments here. It's, it's very compelling, the secondhand um, opportunity. That said, there may be also uh, on the new buildings, but I hope it doesn't um, become too widespread. Okay. I mean, Will, I mean, Wak Wong is uh, well known for ordering vessels generally rather than buying on the secondhand uh, market. Uh, what do you think about the attractiveness of new build bulk carriers? Yeah, I think I can, you know, back up what Asab has said with action is we've only ever ordered new buildings since the 1960s until November last year when we bought our first second hand ship. So that tells you, I mean, it's actions rather than words. Definitely conventional new buildings, there's, as Vikrant said, a regulatory overhang risk that I think is very difficult to, to um, you know, to value that risk. Um, but there is, if you just think about it today, for especially a larger ship, you're probably going to get that ship 2024. And that ship's going to last till 20, what, 44. I mean, look, it's a hell of a lot that's going to happen between now and 2044, which makes the chances of that ship you know, living a full economic life, I would say, very, very slim. Um, and so if that means one has to adjust one's depreciation policy yeah, but very aggressively and then take a take a view on you know current market and um it still makes sense because new building prices have moved up tremendously don't forget that it's not as if you know they've stayed still 
partly because input costs have gone up, um, still obviously, uh, uh, you know, it's very high level. And so, you know, I think as someone who, yeah, you're right, we uh, traditionally have been new building players are very much, you know, not doing that at the moment because it's, it's just sort of an unquantifiable um, risk on the, on the residual. Okay, thank you. Let's uh, look forward uh, a little bit for the next 10 or 15 uh, minutes. Uh, the environment and generally ESG is the biggest issue in shipping at the moment. It affects all decisions, company perception, relations with stakeholders, certainly new investments, and banks will require benchmarking going forward of clients in terms of green credentials. There's uh, an industry debate regarding optimum future fuels and propulsion types. I mean, so much going on in that area. Uh, and all these issues and regulations may be seen as a hindrance, I suppose, to uh, shipping uh, operations. But it must also be acknowledged as an opportunity to clean up, to modernize, to improve systems, and to make for a more sustainable business. Um, so on the panel, we have a mix of public and private companies, smaller and larger. How does each of your companies handle the issue of ESG and factor it into decision making? Um, Vikrant, let's start with you. I mean, you're a small private company, a relatively small private company. How do you look at it? I think, uh, Kevin and, and panelists, there's no doubt that, you know, uh, charters, uh, banks are all getting more focused on this, in, and particularly, you know, in, in investors who are, who, are, who are supporting these, these institutions. So uh, it, it would be, I would say, to go even go to the extent of saying it would be irresponsible for anyone involved in the industry today to ignore these issues. These are, as I said, they're they're, they're, they're actually going to come faster than we think they are. Uh, and, and unfortunately, they'll be forced on the industry. So uh, for, for small ship owners, uh, you know, it's difficult for us to be leaders like, uh, say, Maersk or MSC or CMA, CGM, and do some of the things. We'll, we are more followers. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we are, we are mapping our uh, carbon footprint. Uh, you know, we'll be able to to uh, a sort of uh, you know put that uh, in in the in in a public space uh, relatively soon. Uh, I think you know it's 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 a challenging space for small ship owners to to look at. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, actually, you know, uh, our major fleet is a handy and. Uh, and the, and the MPP and the um, so it's even harder yeah. for us trying to trying to see the uh, availabilities of the uh, new technology solutions for our type of chips. Um, in, main engine is a problem, but on top of that, um, the our ships go to all different all different kind of very difficult place in the world. So the supply. Uh, facilities is also can be another challenge that we have to looking at uh, for the various uh, so-called new solution. Um, so from my side, um, I think AMP have to monitoring the new development, uh, closely monitoring that. And on the software side, we try to get ourselves ready. We trying to learn from the uh, the latest um, the development of various new technologies, a various way um, to systematically try to operate, to operating under the new environment. It's, I would, I would quite um, disappointed to say, it's still in the very early stage, although we do see that the uh, new environment policy is going to come in, uh, probably faster as we, as, as we all uh, believe. Um, However, I think the technology wise is still lagging behind and it's still quite unclear how, uh, for example, the, 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 the people is going to handling that, let's say, in coming five to seven years. Mm. And not perfect. I think, uh, no, I, I agree. I mean, I think it's very diff it's, it's different, isn't it, for, for owners of large container ships, large tankers, LNG and VOGCs, very expensive vessels. I mean, they can take a different view, I guess, on making certain investments, such that proportionately that investment is not so high compared to the uh, 
bowie of the vessel. Mads, what about you? I mean, you're, you, do, you, do you have a different sort of level of um, shareholder and stakeholder uh, pressure on, on, these, uh, on these issues? Well, it's certainly only going in one direction, as the other panelists uh, mentioned, right? So we've been having an ESG report, sustainability report, published for many, many years. So I think we, we're reasonably uh, well up to speed on what uh, investors and banks are looking for and have been transparent uh, for, for quite a while. That's one thing, right, is the, being transparent about it. But I think... Uh, you mentioned it's kind of this a hindrance. Uh, I think it's not a hindrance. I think it's a great opportunity. And that is what sets up for the good market we're now having. And, and the lack of new buildings is the major kind of takeaway, right? That people understand that this will change technology and fuel. But, you know, we need a whole new bunkering infrastructure and it's going to take time. So to order a new ship today with a fuel oil engine, I think it's absolutely crazy. And um, I would not be surprised to see f ships with fuel oil engine, new buildings banned uh, in, you know, in the not too distant future, right? So why take that risk? And, uh, but, you know, the, what will happen is the practical thing to do with the existing ships is to slow down and IMO will force that with the new rules coming you know, 2023 20, for and, and 24, and we'll see the exact details now from the IMO meetings uh, this month. So, you know, that is another very positive effect for the market uh, in, in the couple of years ahead, and it will be a forced slowdown. But the other takeaway is to, of course, optimize fuel efficiency, do every retrofit you can do on on your ship, uh, it's also, of course, to analyze these new AER and you know EXI, EOI uh, rules and how they will impact various designs, and only look to buy the designs that rate uh, better. Uh, I think it will be a very healthy development because the better designed, the better built ships will have an advantage, and they don't have to slow down as much as the worst designed ships and the worst designs will be pushed out so i think it's a it's a great opportunity and you have to do it you have to embrace it and uh uh and it's only it's only going to increase okay and will i know that wai kuang have been quite pioneering uh, in in this respect i mean i think you've taken some uh uh, sort of carbon issues on, on 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 trips and things like that. I mean, so clear, clearly Guacuang is uh, it has strong views on on ESG and the whole the whole issue of of, of, of the the industry no, yeah, going forward. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you talk about it as a burden. I always think of you know people saying they complain about the cost of insurance. You say, well, if you think insurance is expensive, try having an accident. And you know, if you think that mm. spending money now on um, decarbonization on making sure you have a sustainable business model, on ensuring that you have a socially responsible business, biodiversity will come into this very soon, good governance. If you think, that, if you think spending money on that's expensive, and well, uh, I'm afraid not spending money on it, you're not going to sleep very well. And that might be something you can get away with for a year or two, but in five, ten years, it's utter madness. And so the time for action is absolutely now. And I think there's a very there's a big difference to what small ship owners like us can do relative to, you know, much bigger, you know, mm -hmm. Matt's as a listed company has different responsibilities, different opportunities for communication. But I think all of us as ship owners, it's a party about general understanding of shipping um, amongst the wider community and about consumers. And, and, and I think that's the, the, the message we all have as ship owners is to ensure shipping is to some extent climbing out of the shadows. And, and I think some people are, you know, looking to target shipping, and I think that's fine um, because it's um, something that, you know, there's a lot that needs to be done. <clears throat> but shipping has been in the shadows to some extent, so there's a lot of explaining that can be done. And, and it's amazing if you sit down and talk to people, they understand the whole business model of the supply chain. Very hard to figure out that, you know, there's a lot that needs to be done, but it's not just simply a question of pointing your finger, you know, the ship owner or, um, you know the obvious, the obvious incumbent. It actually normally comes through to the consumer. I, you know, I always say this, but shipping plays a huge role because 
we've heard it in one of your earlier panels, I think, you know, the supply chain goes right from the raw material to, you know, the consumer. And even though shipping itself is quite small in terms of carbon emissions, if we're just going to talk about carbon, it obviously is actually carrying the burden. And at a moment in time, those ships are carrying the burden for pretty much all of the consumption that takes place. So it's a very, very good point at which to start assessing, you know, how do we quantify the, you know, the, the um, carbon? And as I say, it's, it's not just carbon. I mean, this is just a starting point. So, yeah, I think there's a lot coming and there's a lot coming fast. We welcome it, embrace it, and it's definitely an opportunity. Okay, very good. David, can I yeah. can I spin here on the same subject? Please, please. Yeah, I just want to say that the 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 problem that we see is the uncertainty, and um, it, it's not always about um, uh, where to invest. It's the question that we still don't know how to invest, and there's no doubt there are risks in in ordering new ships when large uncertainty on technology. There, there are existing risks also with older tonnage. Of course, if these can be unencumbered in a short time through, through good earnings, then that risk diminishes. Um, but it has to be mentioned um, how we measure emissions and how we, the lack of standardization, not only in shipping, but in the larger uh, environment that we're in, really, in my opinion, hinders uh, part of this this big challenge. Um, and we have to start looking at life cycle emissions uh, across the board um, and standardization, both on the type of fuels and future fuels so that really we can reduce this uncertainty and, and make those correct investments um, for in order to really help help the environment that's in the end um that's the the larger goal that we're we're all um partnered to okay thank you very much so we're, we're almost out of time uh, we have a couple of questions from the audience which i'd like uh, to ask now one is uh how do you view counterparty risk for period charters i mean i guess you know the um the rates are higher the amounts involved are higher the risks are potentially higher how do, how do you we grant how do you how do you assess that risk i think that's a that's a great question uh, particularly you know when when owners want to take period at, at these high numbers and uh, counterparty risk uh, starts to become a concern uh, everyone can remember some of the you know the heydays back in 2008 9 where you had uh, large large con large charters uh, large owners fixing to the likes of korea line and things like that who didn't mm. perform. So, uh, yeah, I mean, KC Maritime, we've always been conservative uh, all over the last 15 years that I've been with them. We haven't had a defaulting charter, uh, even though we had some some rates, uh, you know, when we had five years at 50,000 plus. So mm -hmm. counterparty risk starts to become a big concern as something that owners should be sensitive to. Okay. Uh, any, anyone else want to comment on that? No. Nope. Then let's just do a very quick uh, to wrap it up. I mean, uh, one minute each on uh, you know the next uh, one or two years. Your feelings, uh, any potential risks to this good market, uh, Mats, Let's start with you. No, again, I think uh, we have a great period in front of us. Uh, you know, for all the reasons that has been that has been mentioned. Uh, totally agree with Vikrant on counterparty risk. Uh, you know to you know, choose good counterparts in everything you do, you know, whether it's a uh, shipyard or, uh, or, or charter. Uh, it's, it's very exciting. You know, we have built our fleet from 34 ships uh, nine years ago to 118 owned now, and we have another 130 on the water short term, F 15 of them are, are long term. So, it's harvest time. We don't need to buy more, uh, but we're certainly more buyers than sellers, as we mentioned, and uh, extremely rewarding for the hardworking teams, both uh, on the ships and in the office, who have kept the ships well maintained and, you know, retained good relationships with the with the customers, and uh, to to now finally get uh, you know good good earnings in in the books. So very exciting times. Thank you. Thank you very much. Should be grand. 
well, I like to think that, that we are at a dance and the music is playing and mm -hmm. we're all enjoying the music, but at some time the music's got to come to a stop. And mm -hmm. the question we're asking ourselves is that, you know, where are we in the dance? Are we, you know, at the, at the start of the music or, you know, halfway through? I like to think that uh, we're getting close to uh, the halfway point, maybe in the next uh, quarter or so, uh, because the, the drivers of our, of our market are quite unique. You know, you have, you have the pandemic, you have bottlenecks, you have uh, supply disruptions, and these will disappear. These will iron themselves out. Uh, so, uh, I'm, you know, my view is that enjoy the music while it's there, but it will stop at some point. Okay, thank you, William. Yeah, it doesn't last forever. I mean, unfortunately, we own tankers. I did. I mention that. Well, it was a good thing a year ago. It's not a good thing. Today. So we're daily reminded. That, um, unfortunately, you know, a market such as this is sometimes a, a rare commodity. But I have to say, I mean, looking at the, um, you know, looking at everything that we've just seen from the from the presentation, and um, you have to say things are looking pretty good. Um, it's probably easy, I think, on the tanker side to look at the fact that nobody's flying anywhere, no one's doing anything, and presumably that will come back to some extent. On dry bulk, this is more um, difficult to link in terms of the pandemic. Obviously, it, it, it made things terribly difficult at the beginning. Now, it just looks like you know, we've got good volumes and a limited supply. So that, you know, those are quite positive things. And um, you know, certainly there's no, no need to panic at the moment. Um, so, yeah, let's just hope that um, we can have a, a sort of, you know, general increase across all the different sectors. That would make me even happier. Thank you, Asaf. The next year or two. <clears throat> yeah, um, yeah, it's time for us to 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 enjoy um, this period, and uh, I think in the short term uh, we will. Um, having a longer term view uh, enables us in port line um, these days as well, in parallel to to think forward if it's bringing um, good people in and uh, top and management and uh, reshuffling and building and looking at other areas like uh, safety, compliance and, and uh, crew welfare while we enjoy this so we can also increase um, you know, our performance and safety. And um, these are things we're looking forward to do and uh, in continuing to enjoy this market as well. Very good. And Mark, last word to you. Yeah, um, I, I agree with almost um, all the other uh, participants here. I think the, the, this year and the coming year, this can be a very good year for the dry bulk shipping. But however, I'd like to mention that in order to um, have a good result, you know, um, the market definitely is the most important facts. However, there's still a lot of details. For example, the COVID uh, restrictions on various port. Um, the risk for the crews to uh, be affected by the uh, mm -hmm. to get disease, for example, and also um, trying to manage the the various new challenges like crew changes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It only was a very good management, and it only you know you need to uh, only if you can pay a lot of attention on the details on the safety issues, etc., etc. Et that is also a very, very important part of our day-to-day -day life for the coming uh, one year or two years. This is how I see it. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. So thank you very much for that uh, discussion. Uh, Matt, Vikrant, uh, William, uh, Asaf and Mark. Um, thanks a lot. The market is good. Long uh, may it last. Um, and uh, thanks for being on today and to Luisa uh, for earlier on as well. Uh, that's the end of session two of our um, Greater Bay Area Ship Finance Forum. Um, in about an hour from now at uh, one o'clock Hong Kong time, uh, I'd like to uh, invite our audience back, an outlook on the commercial principles in Hong Kong, and of course, a look at uh, shipping finance, the bread and butter of uh, marine money. For now, thank you very much and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.